Can you see it fairly full screen? Uh, no. No. Okay, I'm going to flip over to uh, a full screen view. Okay. Once you're, once you're ready to go, let me know. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for, for joining us for our LTAD lunch for, for April. Um, we have a, a great presenter, um, Meredith Gardner. We'll kind of do an introduction in a little bit. But before we start, maybe we'll go around the room and introduce uh, yourself. Um, please remember to speak um, outdoor voice to make sure that uh, the audio gets it's picked up. And I wanted to say thanks to Jason Sostrom and TSI for being our new host for In Person in Calgary. So Dale looking good there. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, maybe we'll start over here in Edmonton. Hi, my name is Christina Pallich, and I'm here with the Lifesaving Society. Linda McPhail with Alberta Sport and Rec for the Blind. Right, George Molsmackey with the Edmonton Sport Council. Jackie Cool, swimming. Gary Shell with the Edmonton Sport Council. Vicki ha Vicky Harbour, Sport for Life. Kay McNeil, Alberta Sport Connection. Kaylee Shaw, Ring in Alberta. Aaron Lavarado, Alberta Sport Connection. Pat Boss, Salon Bowls. And in Calgary, who do we have? You can just put it in the chat box, Jason, and I can read it aloud if that works. Sure, I just turned my turn my mic on to see if that would work, see if it's it coming through great. okay. Yeah, it works great. Okay, great. So, okay, so uh, right now we just have uh, uh, Jason Schultz from CSI Calgary and Dale Henry with CSI Calgary. Great. We're expecting a couple more coaches, but I'm sure they'll drift in. For sure, and uh, I know um, there's some of the Calgary-based PSOs will uh, will uh, understand the change and, and join you shortly. We also have uh, Chris Daw. Yeah, hi, it's Chris Daw here. I'm just newly with the Active Alberta Coalition. Fantastic, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so today we have uh, Meredith Gardner. Uh, Meredith is a two-time world champion in freestyle skiing aerials in 1985-1988. She was active as a coach and in developing youth programming until she worked in the media between 1994 and 2004 as a reporter. Um, she's also a color analyst and a producer of a wide variety of news and sports programming. Meredith returned to freestyle skiing in 2005 in rebuilding Freestyle Skiing Ontario and for the past 10 years has worked as the Sport Development Director for Freestyle Canada, building out the long-term athlete pathway, including revamping uh, the coach-athlete and officials and competition systems. Uh, Meredith recently has gone out on her own to pursue her passion of developing tools for sports to effectively include all children and youth with hidden disabilities. And today is sharing samples of the research being piloted through the Count Me In coaching workshop project. So we're very fortunate to have Meredith. Thanks for, for joining. Is that my cue? That is your cue to take it away. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited to share this uh, project with you guys. Alberta, I know, is on the leading edge of a lot of work that's been done in sport right now. Um, and it's amazing that you bring your community together like this. Um, so I'm going to flip over to, um, so everything is full screen, but it'll make a full screen on my computer as well. So just so you're aware, if you need to interrupt, I'm not going to see hands up. Um, you're just going to have to speak up or if you'd like to uh, interrupt. For sure. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat box if anybody has uh, any questions or whatnot. And I'll, I'll, if people raise the, their hand in the room here, I'll help you out. So for sure. Great. Okay, so um, Count Me In really started, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a snapshot of what the project is, where we're at with it, so and sorry, also- Sorry about to interrupt, but uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> right away, but the screen has gone, on, gone dark on us. Oh, well that's not good. Yeah. Let's give it a second to see if it refreshes, and if not, I'll go back. Okay. No luck? Unfortunately. There it goes. Now we're good. Okay. All right. So I think what we're going to have to do is work with this um, this size. The question is, can you guys actually see the slides? More or less. It'll work. Or I can try this one. 
Yeah. What about that? It's better. Um, no, and that <laughs> cuts in and out. So if you go to the first one, I think we'll just work with that. Okay, great. Meredith, can you zoom right. in? Just um, yeah, I make sure that the, slide, the slide bar at the bottom from 62% to maybe 80% or something. Yeah, I need sure. some coaching. Yeah, <laughs> even a little bit more. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, a little more wouldn't hurt. <laughs> the director of coaching at CSI saves the day. Excellent. Yeah, there you go. That's, Don't that's, real, that's real clear there. Yeah. Is it clear? Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, thanks, Jason. So, uh, really, uh, probably, I'm going to give you the background of how I got involved in this. Um, I come to sport uh, through a path where I was actually um, a camp counselor, a high performance athlete, ran a lot of programs for kids, and probably, you know, not through any kind of teaching or psychological background, just always been very passionate about the inclusion of children in sport and um, the inclusion, you know, and programming for kids. Uh, when I came back from being a high performance, or sorry, from being a journalist, and I got back involved in sport and freestyle Ontario, one of the things that I really noticed when I went out on the ground, uh, and I was a volunteer at that point with the programming was that there was a serious issue around leadership that um, quite simply the coaches didn't know how to lead programming for children, which is a much more difficult adventure than most people realize. And, and I think that often in sport, we really minimize the expertise that's required to actually run quality programming for kids. Um, and basically, when I became a sport development person, I knew something about the sport. I had a warm pulse and I was willing to work for peanuts. And that's what was required to be an expert in sport development at the time um, within a, a PSO. Um, and, and I don't mean to minimize the work that people do, but I, I think we recognize that uh, sport development is still a fairly unknown field um, in terms of our, our amateur sport organizations. Um, so. I then became, uh, after working in the sport for five years, I became a parent, and I became a parent of a child with autism, uh, high-functioning autism, which, you know, is a real uh, challenge with social skills, and quickly realized how our sports system not only does not generally have strong leadership training uh, for managing programs with youth, but there's almost no training for managing programs with youth who struggle to be included. Um, and the scope of this issue, which I wanted to talk to you guys about, um, right now, essentially, we have these incredible adaptive uh, and competitive and recreational sport worlds, special O, all kinds of different organizations um, that deliver to a clientele who is, is specifically adaptive. And then we have our competitive and recreational sport worlds. Um, most kids who I would say have what we'll call hidden disabilities, so ADD, ODD, autism, uh, attentional issues. These kids don't belong in the adaptive and competitive sport world, but they don't fit very well into our mainstream world. Uh, if you look at the population of kids, if it's one in five kids, which are estimated kids who fall into the realm of hidden disabilities, um, that's 1.6 million Canadian children. And the scope of it, uh, in some recent research that's been reported by Huffington Post, they say there is at least a recorded 850,000 uh, Canadian children who uh, severely struggle with cognitive, social, emotional issues to the point where, um, you know, their lives and their families' lives are, are fairly severely impacted. And we know that most of these kids do not fit well into the competitive recreational sport world, and mostly because. Uh, we're not set up for it and our coaches, most coaches, again, I'm just gonna say most because coaches who've had been teachers and had training or happen to be particularly empathetic often can include, um, but that's uh, you know still a small percentage of our coaches. Um, so what happened was as I went to Sport for Life conferences and I went to meetings like um, I was at a great high five meeting where they're talking about their mental health module and, and LJ Bartle asked the question, what do you do with, uh, with kids who have ADD in your programs? And, and somebody from one of the NSOs put up their hand and very honestly said they get cut from the team. And, you know, I was 
at the moment I was like, oh, we got to do something about this. And there were a couple other people in the room who were really feeling the same way. So started the idea of count me in of, of going, what do we do in sport? How do we stop the exclusion of, of kids who have mental, uh, social, cognitive, emotional challenges from sport? Um, and we were able to go out and formulate the idea. One of five uh, key principles was to create a coaching product. Um, the working title is Count Me In, just so you're aware it is not being a trademarked or licensed title yet. Uh, we were able to partner with Freestyle Ontario, who went to the Trillium Foundation, and we're currently in a $75,000 seed grant, which is a research and piloting grant. So we've created a module, we've researched it, we're going back to subject matter experts across Canada to validate the content, to make sure that it's evidence-based, um, and at the same time delivering to coaches on the ground and getting their reaction if the tools that we're building from the evidence are actually working on, you know, in terms of training on the ground. Um, and just so you guys are aware, Freestyle Canada was an incredible supporter of this project um, and probably has dedicated about, you know, close to $100,000 worth of effort, time and funding to support this project. Um, Canada Snowboard, as well as partner, the Canadian Association of Adaptive Snow Sports, a very strong partner. And um, one of the areas that we're taking our research as well is has been around their cognitive impairment, uh, adaptive coaching training that they do. Connects Autism Network has been an incredible resource. And we're working with a, a, a gal, Fern McCracken, McCracken, out of eLearnology out of Ontario. So if you are aware of eLearnology, They've done all of the instructional design and online learning for organizations like High Five, um, YMCA, Big Brothers and Sisters, City of Mississauga. So uh, lots of great leadership there on how to develop training. Um, I'm going to kind of briefly pause before I jump in a little bit deeper to see if there was any questions around what the project is and what the scope of the project is. Uh, no questions here in Edmonton, um, and nothing in the chat box as yet. Okay, great. So I'm going to keep going. Um, Sport for Life uh, has been probably one of the key organizations that has been pushing uh, sport into the area of looking into skills that are not strictly <coughs> physical, technical, um, or performance related mental skills. So uh, I'm sure we've all seen the athlete development matrix, the quadrants that are currently being looked at. And, and probably five years ago, if you were looking at this diagram, it would actually have said uh, physical, technical, uh, tactical, and mental. And mental was related to performance. So it's only been very recently that um, sport has opened up its eyes to this gap that we have in approaching learning in sport from yeah. A psychological perspective and what those skills are. Um, I got a little bit of a, a quiz here so I'm gonna have to see the chat box um, and I'm gonna ask you guys th these two diagrams there's two di diagrams one on the left of the brain and the one on the right with the circle they both represent uh, areas of thinking or, or uh, that are currently very popular around um, that are going on around learning in the psychological realm. So I'm going to ask you, does anybody know what is the group uh, name that is represented by attention, impulse control, social awareness, etc.? So type it in, and Aaron, you can see what we're getting. For each of them, or you just want just that group, the attention, impulse, control, task initiation group? Yeah, on the left. What does this represent? What is this group of things? Dr. Harbour says executive functions. That's kind of cheating. She just did a whole presentation on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to save if you can't answer. Okay. <laughs> <Probably. laughs> My opportunity to uh, in reinforce things, Meredith. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So other than Vicky, this group on the right, self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, uh, relationship skills, social awareness, what is this referred to? Anybody? 
I'm going to give you a big hint. It's in the middle. Social and emotional learning. <laughs> SEL. Okay, so I'm going to ask for a bit of a show of hands. Uh, have you got the hands there? Um, we don't have that. That's for the go-to webinar. We just have. This is just go-to meeting. Okay. We have the oh, raise the hands oh. thing. So. Well, uh, okay. Sorry. So please. Um, maybe you guys are in the room. Have you guys, are you familiar with these concepts of executive functions or social emotional learning? Uh, Probably. Half hands are kind of raised, they're kind of aware, not fully aware. Except for Vicky. Yeah. So, um, social emotional learning is, is a huge driving factor in education right now. Um, and you know, as education is realized, as it's pushed towards inclusion, that they cannot have effective learning for individuals simply by setting out lists of outcomes and things that people have to learn. Uh, if you know, if you can't understand the learner and how they learn and and the social, emotional, and cognitive factors that they're taking the information and using it on, um, essentially they're going to fail at inclusion and, and fail at learning. And one of the really interesting facts. Um, Justine Simmons is a gal who uh, built all the original research for us. She did an incredible job, and she's actually a former um, mogul skier with our national team who became a mom who went off to do a lot of interesting things and has recently decided uh, to do an education degree. So we took advantage of the fact that she was getting all the most recent research in BC access to it and how to do the research for Count Me In. And she said there's a, there's a huge switch that has just happened in BC. They used to say that if 75% of your class had 75% of the information, uh, then you could move forward with your learning. That That's when you move forward. So at some point, somebody finally clicked in or they clicked in and said, well, we're consistently leaving 25% of the kids behind. And that's not okay. Right? So this is the shift around inclusion is to actually say, who are we consistently leaving behind and why? And this is where we're starting to understand the critical importance of what the, uh, what the experience of the learner is that's driving them to leave. And we've really anchored in the Count Me In Project to Dr. Ross Green's philosophy. You know, you guys can read this. Kids do the best with the skills they've got. Um, Ross Green has written uh, probably what his most famous book is called The Explosive Child. And, and it's like, why are kids exhibiting this challenging behavior? So when they don't have the skills to participate, they adaptively respond through explosive behavior often. Maybe not always, but sometimes. Um, I think the really important thing that Ross Green says that applies to sport is that kids and, and youth, people in general, but we're, you know, our focus is, is children and youth, is that they want to be in the program, they want to please adults, they want to be part of the group, you know, they, they want to be part of the sport, that's why they're there. Um, and when they act out, it's really because they can't participate effectively, they don't have the skills, right? And um, we have a video, so, Aaron, why don't you try and see maybe if you can Google this, and I'm going to see if it plays. Okay. To start. All right. At the same time, let me know. <clears throat> Is it playing? Uh, it's kind of choppy. Um, I don't think it's going to play. Maybe I will try. To, I'll, I'll make myself the presenter quickly and um, okay. and uh, see if I can, I'll just play it from my email. Um, so why don't you guys there in the room tell me what can you see? I took it away from you, sorry. Okay. Give me a second. Let me try to play it from my email and then... Um, At RN Meredith, we saw that the video was um, was kind of jumping from frame to frame, and there yeah. was no sound. Okay. All right, Aaron, give it a try. Okay. Okay. 
And if not, we're going to abandon it. And we'll figure this out for the next time. The link's, Video up. Is always the link's not coming up. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to describe it to you guys. So, um, and you can give me presenter status back, then, Aaron. So what we had was a video of a coach, and this is something I'm sure you can well imagine. The coach is standing there. He's got a bunch of kids. He's trying to describe, hey, everybody, here's what we're going to do today. And he's got this one guy, Jackson, who is very happily running around behind the group with his arms out laughing, and all the other kids are laughing at Jackson. And the coach is saying, Jackson, sit down. Jackson, please sit down. Jackson, sit down. Jackson, sit down. Jackson, sit down. Right? I And I think um, <laughs> this is a pretty common scenario that we see. So, uh, you know, the question for us, if we're going to really look into this and, and keep Jackson in the game, is why why is Jackson running around? What's his behavior? Um, Can you guys still see my screen? Yep. OK. So where we started with this project again was like, oh, well, what we need to do is go through all the diagnosis and you know, what, is, what is attention deficit disorder and what might that look like and what is uh, oppositional defiant disorder and what is you know, autism and, and what are all these many different things. Um, and, as we started, and we really did that in the first few pilots, and, and we, we heard back from coaches, and, and they were really uncomfortable with our looking at these as disabilities. Because what they were seeing was a bunch of behaviors. And those behaviors could actually apply to a bunch of different, uh, different learning challenges or disabilities or, or you know, lacking skills. So, these are the learning, the difficult behaviors that we see often. And just so you're aware, this word difficult behavior came from the UK. This is the term that they've landed on rather than challenging behavior or hidden disabilities. So a difficulty making friends, aggressive, reactive, rigid, withdrawn, difficulty following instructions, disruptive, impulsive, inattentive, disorganized, sensory issues. These are all behaviors we see that we need to deal with. Um, but what we've learned is that trying to educate every coach to understand a whole bunch of disabilities that may relate to these things was not effective. So we had have created in the course uh, a lot of scenarios that relate to those difficulties. Um, what we found was that as we sent coaches around the room to look at the scenarios, they didn't have a process to apply to start to think about the behavior and what they were going to do. Because most of the time this is happening in the moment, on the field or on the ski hill. And, and the coach has to take some action right then and there uh, to, to change how things are going. So the first thing we did was create a just-in-time problem-solving process and defined it as step one, observe and identify the disruptive behavior. So this is really important and what we talk about with coaches is Stay calm. Uh, don't jump to assumptions uh, that this kid is full of sugar or that they're spoiled, right? Or that they're uh, so cognitive, cognitively wired that they, they can't participate. Stand back, watch the behavior, and, and try to figure out step two, assess what does this child need or what are they struggling with? Ask the child what's going on, you know? Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you bored? Are you tired? Are you angry? Um, and try and include strategy. So this is the process that we are working with coaches to apply. This, this is the paradigm shift around inclusion. This is the toolbox of strategies that work most of the time. So we have done uh, a lot of research around what are the strategies that work consistently? Um, and what are the evidence-based reasons that these strategies work? So 
this we created this include acronym and and just so you're aware even now we are we are reformatting this um we thought this was a great way to include acronym but it's it's too long and our piloting people have said it's just not sticky enough because it's too big of an acronym so uh this is this is a kind of very detailed work we're doing right now in in terms of creating education um so the I'm going to walk through very quickly these strategies with you. Um, this is probably an hour's worth of work in the workshop. Um, so inform me, probably the trickiest thing for sports, and we, we've actually had a lot of pushback. I had a, a room full of uh, people in Ontario two weeks ago that included um, uh, CADS instructors as Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance, Alpine Canada Ski Racing, Snowboarding Freestyle, and talked about how predictability for the athletes and for the parents is so critical to reducing that anxiety and for them to be able to click in and follow all of the activities, they need to be front loaded. They, they, it's really critical that they, they have lots of time beforehand to know what's gonna be coming up in the session. Um, they need to be led through the session with front loading of what's coming next. Um, so this involves a lot of an administration and communication and planning. Um, the sports just, they look deflated honestly they're like we can't do it so i would say you guys as organizers and leaders there's going to be a lot of work on the administrative side and building communication systems to inform uh athletes and their parents of what's coming up and a lot of work with coaches around building predictability um the next factor negotiate and motivate um, so we bring across one really uh, key activity which is using a first then model which um, I learned through the Canucks Autism Network and this is a very well accepted strategy um, in working with occupational therapists and working with children so why is this important um, so this idea that you need to be able to listen to the individual, find out what is motivates them and collaborate with them on the solution. So first then is quite simply maybe, you know, first you listen to Meredith blather on for now, you know, 20 minutes, and then we give you a cup of coffee, right? Um, what are we doing to motivate you guys to listen to this? So with an athlete, it might be, um, first we're gonna do these, uh, 10 minutes of, of practice kicking with, you know, we're going to do this drill and then we're going to let you guys play the game that you like to play. Right. Um, chill out zone. This is all about self-regulation. Um, and I'll give you a great example. Uh, again, for my son like in gymnastics, in the Whistler gymnastics club, they've got one of those big uh, padded donuts that they roll kids around in. Um, and they would let him sit in the donut. That was his chill out zone. So whenever my son was feeling overwhelmed or like he couldn't participate, he would go sit in the zone for a few minutes and then the coach would come and get him back. Um, so what we're doing with coaches is working with them and a bunch of ways that they can create calming in a chill out zone and help kids self-regulate. Meredith, question, question on the first yeah. one from, from Vicky on the Informi. Um, why were the coaches so deflated about this piece? And uh, can you provide an example of what this looks like on the inform me piece? Yeah, um, give me a quick second here. I'm gonna show you actually, I think that's the easiest way. This is our uh, version five for the workshop presentation. I'm going to open this up so you can see it. So this is what we showed the coaches. Um, can, can you see that? It's a pretty small. It's pretty small. Um, it, yeah. That's All right. So I, I, what, it, what this is, in, in, yeah, inform me and my parents of the plan. So this is an example of what if, you know, every Tuesday you sent everybody, what is the plan for your program on Saturday? All right, and this was an idea of like, here's a great plan. Um, we meet at 8.45, we're gonna do a dynamic warm up. 
one kid is going to become the star of the week. We, we told who is going to be the star of the week, right? So we built a social emotional learning, a group inclusion strategy around having star of the day. We've, we've created a great warm up and we bundled into a predictable time. Um, an hour running gates. This is a ski plan. An hour of moguls. A note to parents. You need some help. Um, noon to one is a lunch. The you know pot but lunch. No phones. Uh, uh, after lunch, you're going to do some duels, moguls training, and grudge matches. So really fun activity. Um, soccer, all club meeting to go over goal setting, and then 4:30 stay for a St. Patty's Day. I pray. So like this should be a fantastic day. There's social components, there's planning, there's technical components. Um, it's very well organized. There's there's, you know, solid warm ups and cool downs like this is to me a perfect freestyle day. And when we presented the idea of communicating this on a regular basis to the coaches, they just felt like that level of planning communication was. And a lot of these guys were leaders. They felt that their coaches on the ground and their programs would drown with trying to do this kind of communication. Yeah, but uh, I think I think a lot of us in the room were quite perplexed by this. Um, I mean, I mean, planning is a core piece of what you know uh, what coaching is all about, and it's even some N NCCP facilitators in the room are giving us the. Uh, I mean, it's all a part of Sport Pathway, so we're just kind of interested to why. Coach, you receive such pushback in this regard. Well, I think this is a disconnect between what we do as sport administrators and what happens on the ground mm -hmm. at our clubs and Fine. with our coaches. Walk the walk versus talk the talk. And, and I, uh, yeah, I think it's just actually like what it takes you know, the amount of work and systems that are available. And, and I'm not saying that no programs do this because um, I've been part of a couple of programs over the years where I've seen this, but like, I mean, I worked at the sport de development level in freestyle skiing for 10 years. We, you know, we have these super coach programs, we have planning, we have LTD, we have NCCP. And when I take my kid up to, what is a really great club locally? The kids are all on phones and the coaches are sitting around and then they break into groups and then they noodle around the mountain. Hmm. Yeah. So okay. this is this is a, a huge task. Yeah. So that that's really so what happens in the disconnect though is that the kids who need this level of structure, and most kids need structure, but the kids who really need this level of structure to be able to participate they get lost. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Um, lead with transitions. I'm going to talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, understand me. So again, this is the difference between, you know, being just so you guys are aware, one of the, the principles behind Count Me In is every strategy, every tool that we use should work for every kid and make the program better. But we will point out tools that are critical. Um, for uh, athletes who fall into that hidden disability bracket. So this understand me bucket, um, very specifically with autism, uh, people with autism perseverate on one thing. I mean, that is one of the three hallmarks of autism. There are lots of kids who perseverate, but kids with autism, that is one of the key things to be diagnosed that they do. Um, so in your program, if you're not able to work around, work with, and uh, integrate what their key area of focus is, if you try to ignore that because it's obnoxious and you know, you're sick of hearing about video games or cats or robots or whatever it is that they obsess about, um, your chances of, of reaching that child and including them effectively are quite small. So, um, theme days that build a theme around what a child with autism perseverates on are a critical tool for including the, and there's lots of high functioning kids with autism that can participate in mainstream sport. So this is where we're taking an idea about rapport and perseverance that are, you know, those are the, um, the, the proven concepts and the evidence uh, behind it 
and we're, we're putting into activities that work for coaches. But we're also highlighting for them, you know, there are going to be some kids that you have to treat a bit differently. So um, demo visually, this is an area where uh, this really relates a lot to sensory processing. Uh, we still have, as we're doing right now, I'm doing everything wrong. I'm talking at you and uh, showing you a slide with lots of visuals, right? So we still spend a lot of time trying to verbally communicate or communicate in writing with lists to people. And um, despite the fact that we know that that's not how people through their senses process information, um, with sensory processing, we also try to give coaches a good idea of how if somebody has highs or lows, uh, if they're hypo or hyper with their sensory processing um, through the seven senses, you know that that can really impact their learning. And it's something that coaches need to be able to look for. The, the last major piece that we work around is encourage inclusion, um, building trust and acceptance. We started this as the idea of building friendships and it was clearly pointed out to us that we cannot force kids to be friends with other friends, but we can create leadership strategies that build trust and acceptance within the group. And, you know, I think, again, Vicki will speak to um, acceptance is a critical pillar of performance, right? So acceptance, performance, and effort are those three pillars of performance, the cycle of performance. And acceptance um, is critical for all athletes, but especially critical for girls. So if we can, if we can really train our coaches on the ground to do a better job of building acceptance, we can do a better job with uh, retaining girls, we can do a better job with retaining athletes with hidden disabilities, um, we can create, build so much ground in this area, but it's it's an area our coaches know very little about. So um, we also have a, a, a tool and a piece on talking to parents. So one of the things that's really critical is, especially for parents of, of kids with uh, hidden disabilities, uh, the parents are the ones that actually know the most about their kids and can give you that information. It's an extremely sensitive topic. Um, the research again reveals that it is more likely that if a parent reveals their diagnosis to a coach or to a teacher, uh, if the teacher doesn't know, that that child is actually going to be less successful. So there's quite a bit of research done around this. So parents are not motivated to disclose diagnoses, and even if they do disclose, most often the coach or the, in this case will not know what to do with that diagnosis. So what we've done is create an action sheet which where the parent can share some strategies or information about their child with the coach that can be, then be effectively integrated into a practice or a game plan. And this is a tool we're working on. We, we've just had a lot of feedback from it. We've revised it three times already, but we feel like we're getting very close. Um, how am I doing for time, Aaron? Uh, you have 20 minutes left. Um, we tried to save 10 minutes for, for questions or discussion. So kind of give okay. it take 20, All right. uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep yakking for a quick minute. One of the other things that uh, was a bit of a stop for us uh, in this project, it was um, when we talked to uh, a couple of, of PhDs in this area, one out of Alberta and one out of Mac, uh, they both gave us the same piece of information that was very interesting. They said in all the work they've done, all the research they've done around trying to shift behaviors uh, with leaders to be more inclusive, they had uh, they've struggled to have luck with people who didn't have empathy through their own experience. So the coaches that have had family members or children uh, that have had you know various disabilities have developed the empathy in the personal systems to sometimes or more of the time to manage those behaviors. Um, but it's very difficult to create that behavioral change in somebody who has not been exposed. So that has really uh, jigged us to really relook at our methodology 
Um, I know Canucks Autism is is trying a tactic which has been quite successful for them over the last year where they're doing train it and try it days. So instead of just going and give a workshop, they give a workshop in the morning and then they do a sport activity with a group of kids with autism and they have those coaches put the strategies and the tools into practice. So what we're trying to do with the workshop is really shift to where there's a lot of practicing with the uh, with the coaches. So like a lot of the slides that I'm showing you now, the, the a lot of the PowerPoint side of things will disappear and turn into activities. Um, this is not a picture of me drowning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a uh, what I wanted to talk about was sort of the philosophy of what we're trying to do with this workshop. And I'm just going to put it out there to anybody to answer if anybody is involved in swimming and they know what the Bob game is and they can tell us what the Bob game is. If they've heard of the Bob game. Lots of different versions. I'm not sure which one you're thinking of. Like when you go underwater, blow out all your so air. Who is that? It's Jackie with swimming. Yep. Hey Jackie. So so um yeah, it's exactly you're bobbing in the water and, and how do you play the bob game? So go under the take a breath, go under the water, blow out all your air, jump up, grab a breath. Any any way you can get the kids to get their head underwater, right? Critical yeah. critical transition to be able to swim that kids are afraid of. So um there was this amazing swimming coach that I saw and uh, it's interesting because it turned out she actually had extensive leadership training and was doing an educational degree and she was playing the Bob game and she led a swim school but the way they played it was they had a game where they just told a story integrating the name Bob so um, I have an uncle Bob who has a pet alligator named Bob um, and has they, he has a son named Bob. Well, Bob the son really liked to play with Bob the alligator, and one day somebody thought it'd be give them, fun to give them Bob the cat. Unfortunately, Bob the alligator wanted to eat Bob the cat, and Bob the son got very upset. So in telling this game with the kids, in the Bob game, the kids would bob their heads every time. They were highly engaged because it was a game. They were laughing. They were enjoying. They could let go of some of the fear. What we're looking for with coaches is what is what are what are the Bob games? What are the things that we can create uh, that will be social emotional learning uh, that will help with cognitive functions um, that will help create self regulation? What are those things that we can standardize across sport programs that will be easy for coaches to do that will gamify and the learning? So this is what we are doing within this instructional design right now. Um, we're also spending more time talking about transitions. So uh, we're pretty aware uh, if you know if you're a teacher or if you work in this field at all, kids with any kind of uh, challenges really struggle to transition from activity to activity. In um, Canucks Autism Network, they have introduced a transition where they very clearly will say, "Okay, everybody, we're going to stop." and sit down and listen in five, four, three, two, one. They practice it several times over. Uh, the kids know it very well. And instead of saying, Jackson, 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 the coach simply says, all right, everybody, five, four, three, two, one. It, it's unbelievably effective. So this is the kind of technique, again, we're trying to put across sport so that coaches have these tools and they're not left frustrated and assuming that the kid doesn't want to be there. Um, I've got a little game for you guys. Uh, it's around a cognitive skill. So the, the areas of skills building that we, again, we focus on are, are cognitive, social, emotional, and sensory. Um, so I am going to put up something on the screen that you're going to remember. And I want you to hold these numbers in your memory. And then you're going to Stand up, you're going to do jumping jacks, and you're going to sit back down in your chair and, and write down in your chat box the numbers or on a piece of paper. So is everyone ready? Ready. All right. Here we go. Pay attention. 
Remember these numbers, write them in the chat box after doing 10 jumping jacks. The numbers are 24, 7, 18, 11, 2, 10, and 24. Go. Okay, so write your numbers in the chat box. I can't see the chat box. Can you learn? Yeah, I'll, I'll read them out as soon as I'll give everybody another 30 seconds to write them in. Maybe we'll go by, maybe we'll just go around the room because most people in here use paper. But Jason, 24, yep. 7, 18, 2, 10, 4. Vicky, 24, 7, 11, 10, 2, 14. Uh, I put 24, 10, 17, 8, 24. Four, <laughs> just got another 24 there in there. Or Jason, 24, 7, 18, 11, 2, 10, 4. Anybody else? Wanna... I put 24, 7, 18, 10, 24. I put 24, 7, 18, 11, 24. We're seeing a trend. I put 24, 7, 18, 10, 11, 24. Yeah. Oh. 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 Okay. 24, 7, 18, 11, 2, 10, 24. <laughs> well, yeah. So same as Linda there. I think we're seeing a trend. That's like you guys are the What's the trend? The easy, the book. Well, it seems the trend is the the you, we get the la the first numbers and the last numbers. Is that the trend? The trend is missing a bit in the middle, jumbling in the middle. Everyone right. missed the two in the middle. No two. I, and I thought by I, I thought by putting the first number at the begin the same in the end it would actually create that effect. That was my theory when I was making that up <laughs> yesterday. So, um, we do an exercise with uh, uh, around working memory, a brand teaser game like this, and what we really felt was important to get across around working memory, which is one of the executive functions, is. Is this idea, and I, you know, again, everything's been ripped off from the internet, just so you know. So I can't, I can't share these slides with you because essentially, once we validate and get all this information down, then we have to rework um, and reshoot anything that we're going to include in in the uh, training. But essentially, the working memory, the theory is, it can take one to seven pieces of information. I, more recently, it's more normally one to three pieces of information. That essentially goes on to like a bit of a sticky notepad in your brain that's your working memory. And it gets held there for no more than 10 to 15 seconds. All right. Then the information uh, kind of slides by your, your long-term memory um, where it may or may not stick. And as more information comes in, the stuff that sticks forms your long-term memory and integrates. Um, the more that your information integrates, the more the new pieces of information can become sticky. Um, what's really critical is, uh, and why we do that exercise uh, where there's an activity, is not only, you know, do pieces of information, so you're only going to take in one to three pieces of information, it's only going to stick for a maximum of probably 10 seconds. And if, if it's disrupted, if your attention is disrupted um, through any other sensory input, as yours did by, you know, uh, activating your vestibular and your proprioceptive, proprioceptive systems, you, you, you've interrupted the train of attention, right? So we are, again, always throwing mass amounts of information and directions at kids. And the likelihood of it sticking without cueing and rehearsing and reinforcing and chunking into very small pieces and integrating with other senses is very low. So it's very low for your average kid. We overload them constantly, but it is next to impossible if you have kids with um, cognitive or sensory challenges. So this idea of, of, of taking information and constantly cueing and rehearsing and reinforcing with other senses is, is such a critical way of thinking about learning. 
that um, we do exercises in the workshop for. I'm going to skip this, this stuff. Um, last little quick piece of information. Actually, 8 to 10% of professional athletes have ADHD compared to 48% of the general population. I'm sure you've seen that Michael Phelps story. Um, there is actually a significant hypothesis that uh, some of these uh, cognitive uh, differences or diversity may actually really be an asset in sport. So um, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. We don't have much time. I just um, we're going to be completing the research by June. Um, and then the goal is we're going to have an implementation plan in place and, and how we're moving forward. Uh, but our goal is certainly to make these materials available through web methods um, and uh, to build out live workshops through partners that will, that will get delivered to sport. Okay, well, well, fantastic. I think that, that that works to our first question was, are are you know are the resources going to be available online and is there a a, a current bank of information um, that we can provide or look towards? We'll be able to provide that, you know, consolidated bank of information in the fall. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, that was a question from Chris and a question from Jason. Um, are there are there age groups that are more impacted than others? Um, or where have you seen the most impact where this works? 5 to 8 or 8 to 10 or 10 to 14 or even older? Well, I would suggest that uh, since we know that seven out of 10 kids are dropping out of sport by the age of 13, um, that I think this work is critical in the six to 12 age group. Because I, I, from what I see, um, most sports have, uh, have pushed these kids out by the time they're 10. Right. If not earlier. Question from Vicky. Meredith, I'm, ju I'm just going to ask you the question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. So there's that, remember the, the, there was the list of difficult uh, behaviors you listed. How, I'm just imagining from a coach perspective, how, how awkward or challenging is it going to be for the coach to discern um, the participant who has, let's say, you know, uh, difficulty listening and not giving this overarching, you have a hidden disability. In the workshop, is it going to be this, everybody thinks that a, that a, a kid that doesn't listen has, has an invisible disability, or is it something about the coach that they're not doing well <laughs> in their practices, or yeah. other options? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, and I, I would say that, um, you know, a couple of things that obviously we don't have time to do here is the conversation about pacing, right? So if you're seeing a kid who's not listening, that's your barometer to that you need to change your pacing, right? Um, you can use some strategies to make sure they're motivated, make sure, you know, try to find out what's going on with them and then circle back, right? And then try, try to, if that's not working, dig deeper, dig with the parents, bring in resources, Find out why you know you're not effectively including that kid. But if if your starting point is to say, ah, uh, somebody's not hearing what I'm saying, they're not taking in the information, they're not engaged. I need to shift what I'm doing as a start. That that that's the shift. Does that make sense? So, and we know that you know most coaches don't have these basic tools around leadership and and group management that are often taught in recreation but not in sport. Yeah, I'm just thinking it's a bit like, um, I mean, even teachers, educators themselves aren't informed about the, the, the continuum of behaviors of children. Um, and so in where coaching in this country is generally not the same kind of profession as it is with it being an educator, um, I, I'm just wondering about how to um, bolster coaches in, uh, in feeling more comfortable with this. And I know it'll be a time, it's a time in the making kind of thing. Yeah, well, and exactly what you're saying is the goal. It's like, keep it simple, 
give a general overview, right, to change the paradigm, give some tools up front within that first session that we know are effective, like transitions, right? So if at least a coach is not so frustrated because they can't get a couple of athletes, you know, engaged in, in being on task and on time, um, if a simple technique like transitions can be the game changer, which it can in a lot of changes, um, you know, we'll give them those frontline tools, we'll, we'll start the process of, of their being able to manage their class better, and then um, hopefully from there, as sports, we'll build out to where people are willing to seek out more resources and more tools, and we'll build more of a bank of, of, of learning and tools and education. Thanks, and, and it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. Like if you look at um, understood.org is an incredible website that's been built out of the States. It's a collaboration of a whole bunch of big organizations that have come together and said, we need to do one central resource for parents and educators. And um, I just saw another one. It was the very first time I came across a, a really well-written and supported article around how to include kids in, co uh, in sport with social emotional, social emotional and cognitive issues. Like it was the first time in six years of research I've seen something that's out there. So it's coming. I think the trick for us, honestly, is now that there's so much money coming down the pipe around disabilities and work in this space, is to cut out the noise and work together on some resources. Fantastic. Um, any we have time for one more question. Respect with the time. Yep. I have one. Uh, this is Christina. Uh, I was wondering if any, if in any of your research, they talked about um, how inclusion fits with resilience training or building resilience in athletes as well, and sort of creating a balance between still getting kids to be resilient and being able to deal with, well, maybe your team didn't win or. Um, not everyone gets to play for every round, but balancing that with inclusion. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, again, it, it's really tricky to communicate this, but it's, it, it, I think sometimes um, we tend to polarize, like toughen it out, and we've we got to make them toughen it out. And um, But at some point, it's about finding that balance, right? So if you find a kid, for instance, um, that can't stand and listen for more than 10 seconds, and you know they need to be able to stand and listen for two minutes to participate in this program, how do you build their attentional skills and their ability to self-regulate to the point where they can get from 10 to two minutes? Th that's what this is really about, right? So it's not saying you have to be able to do this for two minutes when it's impossible because they don't have the skills. It's, it's about how to build those skills and the resilience gradually right hand in hand great um just a, a last comment from jason and um it'd be great to see some of this info in a format that coaches could access a bit at a time or, or even parents it is such a big topic that it might overwhelm some and i think you're right jason um certainly uh, meredith as, as things formalize maybe it's uh an opportunity to come back and revisit us here in the fall um, and make some connections here in Alberta with the work and um, provide that access to, uh, to leaders here and, and coaches. So, Yeah, that would be amazing. And uh, please reach out to me if you want to have a further dialogue around this, if it's you know, something that you feel you can impact or that you need. Those are the conversations we're having right now. So much content in, in, in just an hour of time. I think this is a great, uh, uh, you know, um, a starting point for us here and you know it definitely deserves a lot more attention in an hour uh, of time so uh, we'll connect later in the fall when things formalize and hopefully maybe figure out how to roll it out with widespread but thank you so much for your for your time um, with us today and thanks to everybody for coming um, just a, just a, a couple things uh, for uh, next month, we have Steve Norris coming in to talk a little bit about strap planning with the, for, for your organization, so certainly an important topic, as well as uh, Indigenous um, uh, Sport for Life uh, and Indigenous uh, Physical Literacy in Alberta Opportunities in, in June. So uh, thanks again to Jason for hosting in Calgary, and uh, thanks everybody for coming today. Um, we'll post the... the 
the session on our website as well as we'll speak to Meredith, Meredith about a follow-up content that we're, I will post it there as well. So thanks so much, everybody.